All right, guys. Uh, I'm super excited about this. Uh, Neve is one of my favorite investors in Silicon Valley. Um, I will caveat this entire conversation saying that uh, in a previous fund, we are an LP in one of Neve's funds. So uh, we've done our diligence and, uh, and came out with a thumbs up. Um, so I'll get that out of the way. Uh, but thank you for coming on. Um, and thank you for kickstarting my investing career. <laughs> we can get into that later. <laughs> um, but let's talk about uh, where are you from and how do you get to Silicon Valley? I moved to Silicon Valley uh, when I was 10 from Israel. So I grew up in the Bay Area. I went to uh, Steve Jobs' high school. Um, where they used PCs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, grew up like, you know, like a mile away from Apple and, and all that stuff. And, and then went to school at UC Santa Barbara. And, um, and then... I was studying accounting and uh, and got a CPA when I was like 20, and then like went to like audit hedge funds because like Santa Barbara is not really like a feeder school for hedge funds, so like auditing them was the closest I could do, <laughs> which was, it was great. And then and then um, it's super easy to like audit hedge funds because it's like cash and marketable securities. Yep. So then the next year I, ca I got into I was exposed to the VCs and the first VC fund that I worked on was Lowercase, which is like the highest returning fund of all time. And then and then cr uh, Chris Saka's story like really inspired me and and his investments in Twitter and Instagram and Uber and it was it was a very interesting portfolio. So and then and he was a lawyer, so it was kind of like somewhat related. So Absolutely. And He's got an incredible story. Right. He, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Chris Saka, um, long story short, was like day trading in college, yep. went into debt, uh, went out, ended up working at Google, um, and, uh, and then did eventually not, did not claim bankruptcy, was like in the whole like four million dollars by himself. Yep. And then, and then after Google went public, he like made it to zero. She <laughs> 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 said he's like never felt richer after like making it back to zero. Absolutely. Um, okay. So, uh, you went to Steve Jobs High School. Um, did they, promote that while you were in high school no i didn't even know it when i when really I, yeah and then i went to community college first to de anza which is like where the where the steve jobs movie was and like where they launched the initial uh, ipod and, the, and yep. the initial mac and and i was like i graduated when i was 16 so i was really young so it was like two, i never took the sats or anything i just um barely graduated high school but then in college i like really like started studying and like all the time so that's awesome what what is uh what's the one thing that you took from your time growing up in israel that like has stuck with you it, it makes you appreciate how other, especially like thinking back over that environment, it, it, it make, it's like very, it's, Tel Aviv is like a bubble. I did not grow up in Tel Aviv. It was like in Hadera, which is like a small, like it's not rural, but it's just like, it, it's, it's like a shithole <laughs> compared, yep. compared to a lot of cities. So uh, it makes you kind of appreciate where people come, f come from and, and gives you context. Different perspective, yeah. yeah. Uh, very cool. Okay, so uh, you're auditing all these funds. Uh, you're, um, you know, working with lowercase, etc. Uh, hear Chris's story. What do you do after you kind of get inspired and you're like, oh, this tech thing might be real? Yeah, so I wanted to join a startup, and, my f and I liked soccer a lot. So my, my friend from high school and college had uh, a sports technology company in Huntington Beach. So that was, if I was, ever, uh, if I was any less naive, I would not have joined it. It was like a really... A like, no offense to it, but they were, like, in school. Like, they mm -hmm. weren't even doing it full-time. So it was a really nice, like, vacation for three months in <laughs> Huntington Beach. <laughs> this is uh, So I moved from San Francisco to Huntington Beach and then left after after three months and then just started kind of reading a bunch of, like, about, like uh, crowdfunding and the Naval story of, of, like, I saw that he was making the private, the I saw that the private market was becoming more efficient. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, with AngelList and those things. And he was the first person I called, emailed, like, asking to work at AngelList and, uh, he said he's only hiring designers and engineers, but the fact that he responded was really inspiring because it, it showed that I can actually connect with these people. And then I ended up working at DataFox, which was kind of like a Bloomberg for private markets. Yep. Um, um, so it was great. And then... So you go DataFox, and then where do you go after that? And then I left, and I was briefly kind of helping my friend at NASA Ames because like it was I, I love the space industry, but yep. quickly realized they don't have a physics background, and it was kind of a and he was like a, it was a tiny satellite company, so I ended up, and then Meerkat just happened out of nowhere, so yep. I joined. So I'm like I want to do that, so then I reached out to to Ben, the founder, and, and wrote this post to get his attention. Because this is like, Meerkat was, this is like a weekend, so everyone's like blowing up. So, I yep. like so, so hold, pause for a second. Uh, Meerkat is a video streaming um, app that at the time just literally exploded in a couple of days, yeah, ripped yeah. through Silicon Valley across the country. Yeah, you'd open your, your home screen, like you'd just open your phone, like the entire home sc uh, lock screen would be, uh, this person followed you, this person that went live. It was it was a really like, like I've never seen something like that. It was like really remarkable. It was, it was like a new type of experience. And then Periscope truly viral product. Yeah, yeah. 
because uh, they're like hacking, not hacking, but like they're, th the original tagline was tweet live video. Yep. And then you couldn't even not tweet it. You, if you went live, it tweeted it. <laughs> so, so like the old like, ha growth hacking days. Yeah, and like Periscope wouldn't even do that, and they were acquired by Twitter. So yep. it's like it was really aggressive. And then like my first day, um, I had to write a, the first day of, um, in that morning. Twitter cut off our API access, so we couldn't. Um, well, so you so uh, back up for a second. So you reach out to the CEO. You write a post, reach out to the CEO, yep. and eventually get hired, right, mm -hmm. to go work at America. I just said I'll do it. I'll just. I'll work for free. Like they they just decide they they weren't planning on going to South by, but they just decide they're gonna go. So then I was like, okay, I'll do like the, I'll do the Twitter, I'll do like the social media. Yep. And then and uh, that then turned out to be like a key thing because um, that's when it really kind of blew up with South by. They every year there's like an app that kind of wins South by. That was unanimously the, like Mar Mashable threw a meerkat parade. <laughs> it was like, it was insane. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so you're there, um, and then you go where after meerkat. And then after Meerkat, I joined Product Hunt. Yep. And um, and for those that don't know what Product Hunt is? Product Hunt is where people discover new apps. People go to launch their apps, uh, whether you're, you're a developer in India making a Chrome extension or Uber's, like, like Uber Eats team making it, like, or Facebook Messenger. Anyone is launching anything, an update, a new app, anything, you're putting on a Product Hunt. And it's kind of, for makers, it's, it's a great, way to get feedback and then and then it, uh, it has become kind of an essential part of your launch strategy so you go to yep. TechCrunch, you do that you go to product on it's it's uh and then primarily kind of tech audience um early adopters absolutely and, and, and it's a way to drive kind of those early adopters to use your product yeah. give you feedback um and then obviously for the early adopters it's a way for them to discover these new products yeah. they're gonna build. and then we expanded on it like when i was there we launched this thing called ship which is a tool that helps people launch a new product so if you have, if you have a test flight like a pr especially like a pre-launch product it's a way to build a community ahead of the launch so then when you do launch you have all these people that actually care about what you're doing they know your story and they could try your, your beta product and absolutely so uh for those of the people that don't know uh neve does very little to almost nothing in the crypto space but um, one of the things that you did at product hunt and that product hunt did very well was build community and build mm -hmm. this rabid uh community that was uh ended up being highly defensible right um Let's talk about that because there's a lot of parallels to the crypto community in terms of or uh, the crypto industry and building community. What are the things that you guys did that worked, and maybe even a couple things that didn't work as you build out that community? Uh, I'll start briefly what didn't work. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> we product hunt is is it's for tech people, and then when I when I joined, we expanded into books and podcasts and and all these separate and gaming and all these separate verticals and. That just didn't resonate with people, and yep. it was, we ended up just diverging back and just okay, let's double down on tech because it's big enough. That's what's working. Yep. Yeah. And then in terms of how you build community, it's it's essentially it's like it's, it's gi giving people early access and 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 for things or it, and that's just that's a tactic. But the goal is to make them feel like part of the team. So, for example, like a big part of what I did with in, in Product Hunt and Meerkat, less hands on in Product Hunt, but it was more kind of a strategy is like sending people swag. So I think there's like a like a community swag and there's like marketing swag. Marketing swag is not effective. It's like you go to a college and you, you throw like a hundred t-shirts and people like sleep in them maybe. Yep. And then there's community swag, which is more people that already like you. And then you send them a shirt and like with a letter or something. And then they like love you for life. And, and so do you think that people, uh, when you do this like highly, t like this high touch, you know, um, interaction, is it because they love the swag that you're sending? No, Do they it, love the it, it personalization? Could be, it could be anything. You don't even have to send a shirt. Just send a letter. The swag is just it stays with them because the letter you end up throwing away. The swag, like the shirt, you end up like wearing. It becomes like your favorite shirt because you really like the people and the. It, it makes them feel like part of the team. Mm -hmm. Same thing with, with, like when you like same like when you have a new hire, you, you should you should give them like a new like a swag pack like like maybe yep. a notebook and, and a computer and, and a shirt it, to make people like feel at home and feel like like they're part of your tribe. Yep. Um, you indoctrinate them. Yeah. And then, and then it's, I, I don't think you can. I don't think you could spend enough money on. You, you can't spend too much money on this kind of stuff because you're just like making people like fans for life. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so so that makes sense to me. Um, so the swag and the personal the personalized outreach yeah. was it was a huge driver of the community. What else did you guys? And do? also, we had early act, like making them feel like they're. I mean, not just feel like, but actually like giving them, showing them early stuff. So we had a thing called like building in public. So we just like tweet out. Or, or email them or, or share like screenshots of like Envision stuff of what we're yep. building and and um, getting their feedback and doesn't you don't have to implement the feedback it's more making them feel like their voice is heard. Yep. And, and this is Product Hunt was taking features and new products etc that they were yeah, working yeah. on 
exposing them or, or showing the community them before they were actually yeah. launched, yeah. soliciting feedback, and then product hunt may or may not take the feedback, but at mm -hmm. least people felt like they yeah. were a part of the process. Yep, exactly. Um, any app could do this, by the way. It's like I end up like, working very closely with founders directly. So what, when I have feedback or a suggestion, I just have it, I can give it. And then by extension, maybe my friends are using it. could also go through me and say it. But then at scale, that doesn't work. So maybe like having, like I'm, a, I'm really not a fan of chatbots. But mm -hmm. then I know like some people are like, building like chatbots into their apps just to get feedback or to like yep. share early, ver like just to communicate with your audience better. Because email is not really effective. Email is great if you could, I mean, it's very high touch and personal. So for example, like even like with Adams, for example, the, and there, there's like 11,000 people are waiting to order the shoes and they're, they're, and you can just email everyone and, and be like, hey, I, you can order the shoes now. Yep. I think that's going to convert like 20%. That's probably, gonna, that's actually going to be really high. Or you could like email 11,000 people individually and, and, and be like, hey, like, do you want, the, like, what's your address? Do you want your, like, I mean, sure, you can make things more scalable and, but making feel like, it's think like if you're going to Hollywood premiere and like you just see like a billboard like you're invited or like someone from the event like tells you hey like we have an extra ticket do you want to come like yep. even if you don't care about the movie you'll probably come because it's like it feels like you're getting a personal invite so um, like s scaling down scalable in, in those ways and especially like at the early stage I think it's really key absolutely and then uh, how much of the product on audience was uh, US based versus international did you guys like do that, anything it's different like 50 /50. 50 50 did you do anything different for the international audience. Um, no, no, but but it was that, that's like it's a cre it's a key point from when it started because when it started it was like very much like Silicon Valley based and then yep. those same people which I mean it, it's based in SF like and these are like our friends basically so the um, they would feel like the oh product has changed but it's mm -hmm. like no not really like I mean you're still on it but you're just a, a tiny minority compared to like the whole audience as absolutely as it is tiny compared to the entire world or even just the United States um, and then but. It should still apply. That's another thing, by the way. So it's like it, there's a danger of not scaling and not, like not making decisions that only apply to your early audience, but then that could, in the long term, hurt you because mm -hmm. you really have to like think what's best for the broader community and ideally without losing that early audience. But what's best for like a broader? Absolutely. So okay, so you've got the personalized touch, right? Um, you've, you've got the swag. You're, you're kind of building the stuff out. What else did you guys yeah, do? Like that Slack, like Slack groups are that was like we had like a seven thousand person sl Slack group that okay. eventually it died down, but it was still like super effective at some point. And even just the newsletter. So I wrote the newsletter every day in the morning, and it's you're talking directly to your community every time. It's having that channel. That's we almost like took it for granted because it was in terms of like announcing stuff because it was such a we just did that every day. Yep. And we usually announced everyone else's product, but when we launched our own, like we had already a channel to do that. And, and how much of that is uh, the Slack group, et cetera, is just digital community, right? What we see a lot of oh, people yeah, doing on social media meetups. today. Meetups are a okay. key thing. So when Procter & throws an event, like there would be like a line. It would, it's like known to have a line like acro all the way across the street. So Okay, so hold on. We, we got to go deeper here because uh, yeah. you used to put the events, right, Product Hunt events on Facebook and mm -hmm. people could RSVP. Didn't mean that you were going to get in, yep. right? It just meant that, hey, I want to go to this. It's on my calendar, and Facebook will send me a uh, notification. You know what's coming up. I remember that you guys held one at um, what's the uh, open air bar in uh, SF. Um, there, there's like an. I what it's called, but I know what you mean. It yeah, was, it was packed. Yeah. I, I forget what it is, and there. Were, I remember this is a couple years ago. There was probably three thousand people, maybe yeah. more, on the RSVP on Facebook. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't in San Francisco the day that it happened, but I remember people sending me photos being like, dude, there's literally like a hundred, maybe more people yeah. standing outside in line trying to get in this thing, and it's closed, <laughs> right? Because it was just full inside. Yeah. Um, I think to, like, something to take away from that is like people weren't there to, like, yes, they maybe they were here like to see like uh, Ryan or, or, yep. or the team members, but like they're there to just be part of the community. Yep. So like apply, that's like a big, like, Pretty much like what what do people want? Like, and I think people tend to like people as like a company when they're announcing something they, or anything or a product, they end up like thinking, like, what do I want? And then here is now you can have it. And then you really should think, what do you want? And then and then by extension, maybe it's related to me. So even like like we're going to dinner later today, right? So it's like how do you get high profile people to come? You don't you don't say, hey, high profile person, do you want to come? And then you go get everyone else. You say. Here's everyone else. Hey, high prof prof profile person, do you want to meet all these cool people? Yep. So it's like, the, and that's where they would come because they get to meet. Absolutely. Someone. Well, 
Well, because I think that a lot of those people who are in that position, they don't want to feel like they are the attraction, mm -hmm. right? They want to feel like they're actually getting exposed to a different audience, a yeah. different. But they're they're just they have interests too. Like they want to meet mm -hmm. interesting people. So it's like, hey, come meet interesting people, and then you know all of you will benefit from that person. Yep. But it's it's not like let's let's get some hype. It, it just it's uh, it's usually comes down to like reversing how people think about things. It's, it's I always end up doing that. Like, <laughs> like people start from like the end and they should have like take a step back and just flip it. Absolutely. So uh, in summary, Project Hunt, it sounds like one, the initial contact, right? So there's some kind of indoctrination of, hey, you are one of us. Welcome to our community. Two is there's a personalization to that uh, initial contact, right? And then three is doing things to, um, would it be fair to say, continue to cause collisions of members of the community, whether it's digitally or in person. So mm -hmm. Slack groups, in-person meetups, et cetera. Um, and as you kind of just continue to do that, it feeds on itself. And then would it be fair to say that at first that's the team, right, doing it? And then there's like ambassadors almost, right? They kind yeah, of take yeah. over those so roles as it grows. Most of the events at first at Product Hunt, they, people just asked if they could throw them. I, I wasn't even there at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. I was there later, but it was people just like all over the world that started wanting to post uh, host these meetups. And then like they would ask, hey, can you like send us stickers? I'm like, yeah, well, like, of course. Like you're doing all this work. Yeah, we could like send, it. and they, they would go crazy for that because like, it's, yep. it's super easy in our part. Because then part. they get to say, "I'm hosting a product hunt meetup." Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Very so very like cool. a, allowing your brand to be an extension. Like, it takes some like trust because like you're basically getting letting other people control your brand, or and and then if something bad happens, then you, it, it, you're kind of like it, it's on you. But so it's it's not without any giving any, anything up. But absolutely. Um, okay, but so empowering the community is, is a key. And that, that makes it more scalable, Yeah. right? Um, okay, so uh, you go through Product Hunt. You guys build this ridiculously amazing community. Um, how do you go from Product Hunt to Investor? So Product Hunt was acquired by Angelus, which mm -hmm. is fantastic for me because I've always wanted to work in Angelus. <laughs> hey, Naval, he came back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I slowly kind of transitioned into Angelus. Uh, Nivi, who is Naval's co-founder, really like, took me under his wing, and, and he was doing marketing, and then I was kind of, let he let me for everything I do like starts with doing the Twitter and then kind of I earned his trust uh, doing that and then I extended to blog posts and kind of running a team of one <laughs> the marketing there because mm -hmm. um, no one else was doing it and then the fun started um, but before you get into the fun but the Twitter thing you, you're d a little bit dismissive of it but it's maybe one of the most important things right because it is the public uh, voice yeah, to yeah. some degree yeah. of this organization yeah so and it was yeah so People usually, do, uh, I've seen this like firsthand where uh, people see that the company's Twitter account is like, they'll let the intern do it. But really that's like your, especially for, for, for especially for like crypto companies or in tech companies in general, that is your voice. Yep. So with Meerkat, that was like super important because like we, it was just all eyes were on Meerkat all the time. And the product end is actually differently because we, we promote everyone else's products every day and then once in a while we have our own annou announcement. Um, but it's still like you're, you're crafting the brand voice from that. That's what I'm doing like a lot, very carefully now with the Shrug Capital account, where I'm kind of treating it like a, it's a parody account. And then, <laughs> like in, 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 cause it's like funny, like I literally walk founders through the Twitter feed and they're like cracking up and then like they like me better. But it, like what it does is like it dememonstrates what I can do. Like the m I'm using my own skills, like marketing, community building and brand voice on my own company now. Yep. And then by extension, I can help you do that. And I don't know if like, right now I'm explicitly saying it, but that just, in, it's implicit like when I'm, talking to founders about it. Absolutely. Okay, so so we're, let's get into that in a second. But uh, you're at AngelList and you say, okay, I want to go invest, right? Walk me through what was your thought process to why you wanted to go invest and then like how you formed your thesis of what you were going to invest in. Yeah, so I've always wanted to be an investor. Like my first ever at Vines when Vine was was, com was coming out, it was like me riding my motorcycle around Sand Hill, like <laughs> taking like Vines of all the, the VC logos. I just really liked it. And then uh, after we were acquired by Angels, I started uh, doing some angel investing using syndicates. You backed, I think, the first two, the only two that I did. Um, and then, but I never thought I would raise my own fund. My dream job would be to like to intern or be an associate, or I was not a, not at a partner level, you know, like an Andreessen or a founders fund or, or yep. something like that. Uh, but why would I, how would I raise my own fund? Like I'm not a founder, I'm not an experienced angel, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not like a VP somewhere. So, um, but then a friend suggested. Why don't you like raise 500k? Um, you could do like a 25k checks. So I'm like, yeah, like I could do a lot of 25k checks from 500k. So that was like within the realms of possibility. That like I could see myself being able to raise that much. I wasn't sure who it would come from, but 
I could probably pull together that amount because I knew enough people in the industry. Yep. Um, and then that turned into three million. <laughs> um, the way that happened was, um, ag again, much like the events, like the I kind of briefly talked about. It's how do you make it something that like that someone would appeal to them. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't at first. It was like focused on me. It's like hey, I'm doing. Like, I'm raising this fund. I, um, uh, it's focused on consumer. I have a sense for consumer. Um, always want always want to work with you. Um, would like would love for you to be involved for like any amount. Like any amount is like key. Like people would say like 10k. I'm like great, fantastic. <laughs> so it's like any amount that you're comfortable. It's 10k with. more than you had before you sent the email. <laughs> yeah, but especially with like the early ones, is that means I could use your name. So like Balaji from uh, who's now the CTO of, of uh, Coinbase. Mm -hmm. He was the first. Like it was the day one before I even officially started fundraising. I, I went to uh, Owen Brainerd, who. Um, who is like a wealth manager for Phoenix, and he said he'd be in. And then I went to Cyanide Founders Fund, and she said he, she would be in. Um, and then Balaji, and he said he would be in. And now I was ready to start fundraising because now I can go like over email to people and be like, "Hey, I'm doing this thing. Cyan and Owen and Balaji are investing. Um, I'm going to focus on consumer. I have a, like, uh, I have a, I think I have a good sense for this. I think founders. Want, like, I didn't say this, but the pitch was basically if founders want to work with me. I have deal flow and and I have access. It was. But it's like more hypothetical because it wasn't really proven out yet. Yep. And then um, the ask was like, would love for you to be involved any amount. And then the first those first emails went to Chris Saka, Chris Dixon, Mark, and uh, Chris Dixon invested with Mark Andreessen, um, and and a few and Adam Draper, um, and then who I were and you, and then everyone basically said yes. So okay, <laughs> so, so hold, but hold on, this is super important, right? Because I think that. Uh, I'm going to brag on you for a second because I'm uh, very impressed with your ability to, one, have the confidence, right, to directly reach out to people cold. Two is you're not really scared of them saying no. Well, right? I didn't think they would say yes. Well, yeah, of Chris, course. Chris Saka wouldn't even get on a phone with me. Like, <laughs> I still never talked to him on the phone. <laughs> like, he, I was trying to get on a call with him just to discuss like an angel investing because I, I see how Naval's investing and he yep. has a different strategy. And I was like, hey, now I'm, like, I'm following your path. Uh, let's get on a call. And then like he was too busy, so I'm like, okay. But two days later, I had to like ask him for money. <laughs> so I didn't think he would say yes. And and then so this is not risk. Like, it when once there's expectations, like then it, it becomes more of a thing. But I didn't think you had no like, expectations. So if they said no, there was not going to yeah. be that much. And the amount downfall. was like the amount was like 500k to a million. Like you know, it was like it's very achievable. So it's like it yeah. There's zero expectations. And then but once everyone said yes, then. Now I kind of changed the pitch because, like, hey, I'm doing this thing. And then I had allocations in some high-profile companies at that point. So it's, um, hey, I'm doing this thing. I have allocation in, like, XYZ, companies like you've heard of, um, so-and-so and so-and-so, and, like, all these people that, that, that you know are, are investing. Um, and then I would still say, like, would love for you to be involved for any amount, but it was really, like, framed as, hey, you should, like, want to be part of this LP group. Yep. <laughs> so then, like, and by that point, that that's that's what took it from like a million and a half to three. Yep. And like, because I just started reaching out to like anyone I could possibly want to work with. And, and you built social capital, right? You you, you built enough uh, validity for what you were doing yeah, yeah. by going to people who were closest to you first, getting them to say yes. Didn't even matter the amount. Then once you could use them as, again, I passed their threshold. I passed their mm -hmm. criteria. They know who I am. Yeah. Right. I'm good enough for them. Then that almost emboldened you to reach out to more and more people. Yep all the way to kind of the edge of your network where you're reaching out to people that you had never talked to, didn't yeah. know. Like I was done fundraising. I was like, it was like a continuous case of being oversubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> but I was fine taking more because I didn't change the strategy. The strategy was to do 50K to 100K checks. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then at 3 million, I knew I could still do that. And yep. Maybe I need to like anchor more in the higher amount, but because um, I shouldn't work with like too many companies, but it didn't change the strategy. So I was fine taking more up to up to 3 million. Um, and then, and what it, the the key thing that I did that was really important was I was not an investor before, so I wasn't like an angel where people would go with me for deals. Like, but now I was. So even if people said no, like I reached out to people that had no business saying yes, and some and some said no by that point. But they one they all agreed. To, they asked, hey, like, do you want to be on the investor updates? I'm like, um, they're like, yeah, I love it. Like, cool. So now I get to like email them. <laughs> These like I don't want to name names, but it's like of course like, the really. I feel like I have like the most influential, like smallest mailing list right now, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. Or and then, but uh, after like doing a few investor updates, now like I've gotten to know them better, and and maybe if I raise like more money, then maybe they will say yes. It was just an opportunity to email people um, every month. Yeah, I mean, look, but but this is again the parallel to 
crypto companies, founders it, it is very real, right? Because uh, one of the things that I've never understood, uh, you know, now sitting in their investor seat is a company comes in, they pitch you on an idea. Maybe you know the founder beforehand, maybe you don't, right? And yeah, you know, I really want to work with you. They, you know, they, they give you the whole pitch. And if for whatever reason you pass, whether it's them, it's the market, it's you, timing, I mean, all the different reasons, they go away and you don't hear from them again until they're fundraising again. And so... Yeah, you always, you, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't <laughs> do that. <laughs> I, well, I tell them all the time, I say, listen, the number one thing that you can do, whether it's with us or any other investor, is just send a weekly, monthly, or quarterly update. And you don't even have to address it to them personally. Just make sure that they're staying up to date with your progress, because when you walk in the door the next time and you're fundraising or you need help, you don't want the last time that they talk to you to be when you're asking for money. Yeah, but even even then, because like, so I take that a, t a step further, basically, is that is still so self -ser self serving. Like, well, I mean, beneficial for you. Like, I want you to know what I'm up to. Then here's the stuff. The way I like, I think of it is like, okay, you've you've allowed me to email you. Um, how can I make like I spend a Pretty much, I'm trying to make the investor update super interesting. So it's it's less so about updates on my portfolio. It's more, here's what I'm noticing, and I think that would be interesting to you. So that's what I'm like, what I'm going to communicate. And then, by the way, here's like some updates on the portfolio. But um, this like, and then it's hard to like make that really. It's easier to do when you're emailing one person because you know what would what they want, what they want. But when you're trying to make it like broadly applicable to over a hundred people, then then it's different. But it, it's it's always coming up with the mindset of um, what does this person care about what are they what's going to resonate with them and then and then like you never the, I never asked for any, I can't, it's like never asking for them it's always like coming like bearing gifts which and then the gift could be like it's uh, an opportunity to invest or, mm -hmm. or or info about your space or, or about but whatever resonates with them that's what you should do and and then you, they should want to be involved involved with uh, what you're doing at Facebook, uh, we had this saying, and I'm paraphrasing because I, I forget how we used to say it, but basically provide more value than you take, mm -hmm. right? And if you, it sounds like you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, I can definitely uh, vouch for you that you have the most interesting updates because I've never seen so many GIFs, emojis, yeah. AR, <laughs> VR, you know, video clips. Uh, it is just entertaining, right? And so when you look through it, it's not only do you, are you saying, hey, you know, I invested in X company and this is what they do and you wrote it in text. You're literally showing the products, yeah. right? You're, you're showing how this stuff works, and, and yeah. it's just Which super eye-catching. takes eye -catchy. a lot longer to do. It takes like you know a month to like work on them. Like as soon as I finish the first one, I start working on the second one. Yep. Um, and then iterating over time, but it's it's the it's the most effective use of my time. Got it. Okay. Um, so, again, you're not super deep in the crypto world, right? But I think that there's parallels in terms of you're building a company, right? Bu building this fund. Um, but you're investing in consumer products, right? And um, walk us through why consumer and what does that entail you know from your investment strategy and then we can um kind of walk through some of the similarities between that and the crypto companies so the funds thesis is th is again not traditional it's things i'm excited enough to talk about for an hour to non-tech audience and and i think that's important for a consumer because you can be you, you can get kind of like sucked into the mindset of like this is like a, especially within the product and audience like don't just build something for like early adopters or for the SF tech scene, or, or whatever your community is doing, it's good to start that way. But for a con spe specifically for a consumer product, it needs to be broadly applicable to mm -hmm. like anyone, like mainstream. So, like, what am I excited about? about to, like, t tell my brother about, or my mom about, or and that doesn't apply to everything. Um, but it needs to be like broadly applicable. Applicable. I don't end up having an hour to talk about each product <laughs> usually. So the way I kind of test my interest is things I'm excited enough to pitch on, on the behalf of the founders, meaning like to get co-investors in. It doesn't really matter what they, if they are in or not or, or what they say. It's more am I excited enough to actually um, pitch it on their behalf. And, and during the pitch, I often want to give them feedback on, on, on pitching, especially if they're kind of beginning their fundraise. Um, and then... And then two, I kind of pitch it back to them to see if I know how to explain it properly. It's all like word of mouth. Word of mouth, like how do you explain something in, in a very simple way? Like because people aren't gonna like take away, especially the first time meeting you, everything you're saying. They're gonna like how do you make sure they know how to explain what you're doing in in one sentence and then maybe like in a paragraph? Um, and it's all like building up to. Th I guess uh, let's talk briefly like about pitching. So it's it's like building. I don't think you can like. I don't think it's it, it's effective to just say any statement with that substance behind it. So. Like anything, anytime you, and separately, you can't like, tell people what to think. So if I want you to like, if you say this is the best, you, that doesn't, no one's going to like 
care about that. You should. You have to validate the statement. Yeah. Right, and don't even up. don't even say it. Like you, you've earned the right to say it after you've like said five factors of, like, uh, of like after you have shown why it's the best, and then maybe you can like narrate what you just said. Therefore, we're the best. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it's like very generalized, obviously. But it's you can't tell people what to think, and then you can't like you shouldn't say any statement that people can disagree with you about. So if you could like say the sky is blue, well, okay, you can't disagree with that, but that also doesn't advance what you're. Like, Yes, obviously it's blue. So it's just saying like step by step, like like little by little, moving the needle of saying stuff that people can't disagree with. To yep. be, and then by the end of the uh, by the end of like saying twenty of those things, like maybe you're at the end of your pitch, and then they can't disagree with it. Therefore, they like your pitch. Absolutely. But but so let, let's talk about this uh, for example. Um, your mission statement, right, or what you're focused on, is something that you're excited about to talk to a non-tech audience for an hour, right? Uh, in crypto specifically, this is probably actually the most egregious example of the opposite, where there's a bunch of early adopters, technologists who have run into an industry, and they're highly talented, very experienced, they've got a lot of capital behind them, and they're tinkerers, they're hackers, right? And so they're building all this technology that can do X, Y, or Z thing. Um, it remains to be seen, is that actually going to solve problems for users and be products that users want to use yeah. now but it, dep it depends what state i think right now like we're, we're in the infrastructure phase of the mm -hmm. of crypto so you're probably not going to i mean there's obviously very ex big exceptions but mostly you're just building inf infrastructure that maybe in a few years is going to enable all these consumer apps and but somebody still has to use the infrastructure right so you so maybe your audience is developers or mm -hmm. people that are doing other things. I'm, I'm not sure I'm not too familiar. Yeah, of course. Well, well, and I think, but I think that the parallel here is uh, the technology is important because it has to work, right? But also what is important is getting the user experience correct, solving the problem, right? And I always tell people that if you sh have two mobile apps, right, that do the exact same functionality, they're the same quality, one is decentralized and one is not, the likelihood that somebody who's using the centralized version is going to switch to the decentralized version is very, very low. There's mm -hmm. some people who will do it, but the majority of people are not going to yeah. switch. If you have a product that is centralized and is a better product than the decentralized version, almost no one's going to leave. Is it fair to like, compare it to like, the Tesla example where like, there's some people that buy a Tesla because it's electric and they want to be clean and, and, and environmentally friendly, but then Tesla, I mean, I think Tesla's winning, but like, forget like the market. Like whole Majority market of the stuff. people are buying it because they think it's a better car. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're they're so not buying like it for the uh, environmental impact. So although it happens some to be decentralized, or it happens to be electric, as opposed to that, like leading with that. Absolutely, and, and I think that that's part of the challenge for people building stuff in the crypto and uh, blockchain world is you are not competing against other decentralized applications. You are competing against all applications right, all infrastructure. And so your mission or your goal is actually much tougher than people building these centralized services and products because you not only have to build it in a decentralized way, but then you gotta build it better than the centralized version. Where do you think it uniquely makes sense for something to be decentralized? Yeah, I mean, look, th there's all kinds of stuff, right? I, I think that the number one, you know, criteria that we really look at is, uh, or really there's two things. So one is if there is somebody who uh, profits or is incentivized to wedge their way in between two parties, right, in the transaction. So that applies across finance, tech, you know, all kinds of different industries. But uh, when you are actually incentivized to wedge yourself in between the two, we think that technology can rip that person out, right? Um, the second thing is uh, trust, right? So really what is happening here is technologists are attacking all of these centralized entities and, and doing all this stuff that you know is pretty sexy and shiny and all that stuff. All they're doing is they're using technology to have a more robust trust system. And so when that occurs, think of all of the products, services, interactions, transactions, et cetera, that you, you know, interface with on a daily basis that you only use because you trust them, right? Yeah. Or, or you at least trust them, so therefore you use it. Do you think that what's happening with, like fa with Facebook and, and the lack of trust with these bigger entities is is an essential moment for crypto, or, or it's do it doesn't so really super sense? controversial uh, opinion? Probably, uh, I don't think that the number of people who don't trust Facebook is very large. If you look at the global audience, over two billion, no, they're, they're a very there is a they're a very loud minority. To over 2 billion, you know, monthly users across the globe. I don't even think that there's 10 million people 
who actually don't trust Facebook, right? Now, to your point, they're incredibly loud. They're right in our face in terms of, you know, U.S.-based media, social media, et cetera. Um, but, but to a lot of people in the world, Facebook is a very, very, you know, net good. Um, and, and so I don't even think that they're aware of the issues, let alone, you know, kind of got their pitchforks out and, and complaining about them. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So another component of these consumer applications, right, not only is building for the users, but walk me through um, how you talk with founders about building virality and, and, and building these like growth mechanisms. Um, and maybe we can use an example. Like let's, let's talk about Atoms, for example, right? So uh, maybe talk about what Atoms is and then we can talk through some of the things that they're doing. Because I think there's a lot of things that apply to the crypto world. Yeah. So Atoms is, uh, it's, it's the, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's Say the, it. it. It's the best everyday shoe. Um, I'll, I'll start from the end. It's these two founders from Pakistan that came from nothing and just were shoemakers for years and went through Y Combinator for like a, a separate shoe company, like a dress shoes. And then and then they realized that people don't really wear dress shoes in the United States. And then they wanted to make a shoe that people are, wear every day. So they like started like interviewing uh, designers at Facebook and Instagram. And, and, and like everyone, like they call them like the new creative. So people that are uh, creative, like what do you want in a shoe? Like they would like go to Nike and like see people wear Adidas. They wear Adidas stores. See people wear Nikes. It's, there's no like lock in, but you see people wearing in suits, like wearing uh, sneakers. And some just want to be like quirky and stuff, like or the orange, but like really just people in comfortable shoes. And then that has been uh, underserved from from uh, like an everyday shoe perspective. Because if you're wearing sneakers, that's maybe like a run, more like a running shoe or a gym shoe, and you're kind of compromising on the look and. Um, and then, uh, and also like a big underserved part of the market is people like have different feet, like different size feet. Uh, it, it's it, more it, common. So, so this is important, right? Each individual has two feet, for yeah. the most part. Yep. And most people, yes. Yeah, and and one of those feet may be bigger or smaller than yeah. the other. Like a, I think a quarter. So don't quote me on it, but I think like a quarter size difference in feet is like maybe like sixty mm-hmm. percent, and then maybe like thirty percent have a half size difference, and then uh, under ten percent have like more than that. So it, it it's it become you probably know people just don't never talk about it but it, it's some your one foot will 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 f- like fit a little bit differently so anyway they do quarter sizing so one if it's better they do quarter sizing by foot some like in size nine and nine point two five for example and then people usually assume it's a gimmick but then like just try your actual size and and it makes a huge difference um, but they just rethought like what a a shoe should be like I when I met Wakas for the first time I told him I have like a hard a hard stop in like 45 minutes we ended up talking for an hour and a half because I've never, like, never heard someone like speak that thoughtfully about shoes and just everything that goes from the design to the to the sole to the outer sole to the laces like you know we need laces need reinventing but like, people are treating about how the laces are uh, it like people people uh, people want laces but they no one wants to tie laces it's all these little things that at the end of the day people end up wearing them every day and and kind of singing their praises. Um, and then, and uh, oh, there's no logos too, so that's an interesting part. Like people don't want logos; they don't want to feel like um, their billboards. The way logos came about, like these all these big Nike logos and Adidas logos, is because in the '60s when the TVs were tiny and, and they were like sponsoring athletes, the only way to like really know what, who's wearing what is to put a big logo on the thing so it shows up on TV. Um, but yeah, no logos, and and that's what they found people want from research. Absolutely, and, and so what they've done though is they've built a product that one people want. And then two is they've done a lot of the things that we talked about from Product Hunt, right? They've implemented in terms of building a community around uh, these shoes, what these shoes stand for, wearing these shoes every day, and, and, and almost made it a lifestyle. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so they're, so like they're not like selling on, it on shoes. They're just like keeping people updated um, through newsletter updates of what they're doing. We got, we got our factory in order. We, we're, we're making progress. Just keeping people... like They have an amazing story, and they're sh- telling the story. And then... And then, by the way, like they end up making like the best shoes, and then people, and then they they see that people have tried them are, are like, very happy with them. Yep. And then people want to be a part of that, and it's like there's a way to like, to to make that a gimmick, basically. Like, but it's you actually have to make the best product, and then and then everything else amplifies it. And I think like the st- the most important thing is word of mouth growth. Uh, that's like the not necessarily like. Re- like Think like you know the way Facebook grew is like all these like you know invites and and, and like, like having all your contacts up and that's like yep. you get maybe like high numbers but the retention probably won't be there versus like getting a friend like no you have to like actually get this make sure you get it, and then they tell their friend I think mm-hmm. 
I don't know what the numbers are, but again, I don't think anyone knows what the numbers are at this point. But if you have a pair of atoms, you're probably telling like at least five people about them and, and get it. And then people also ask, like, because there's no logos, people don't know what it, they are. So like they would see the shoes and, and be like, what are, what are they? And then, or especially if they see like a second one, like then it's like they, they put two together and like, okay, hey, what, what are these people are wearing? And then um, it, may, it kind of turns your customer into to pitch your product on your behalf. Same with Morphin, the, the GIF thing yep. that I keep tweeting. Uh, I've regularly said I've referred over 100 people, uh, 100 people to their test flight because everyone keeps asking what these are, and then they added a watermark to it, and then that stopped, and then people get a support because they're disappointed because they would like see what it is and they'd go to the app store and they can't find it, and then but and even if they could like it, it neutralized the conversation, and then when they took it away, it's like you you see like the product stands on its own like both Adams the shoes people know what they are because of what they are not because it says the name. Same with Morphin, like the GIFs, it has like a very distinctive look. And then that just gets your uh, your early users to become almost like salesperson on your behalf because it invites every, like their audience to ask about them. Well, and, and Morphin is interesting because it's a technology product, right, where they basically take, it's not even a GIF as much as a, a very short video, right? Yeah. It can be, you know, five, ten seconds. And they take your f- face, right, um, and they impose it onto uh, into that video, yeah. and so it literally puts you in the video, and then you can send that. And so there's ones where you know you're Superman, you're you're all these different characters, and so when you post it online, what you end up seeing is you know my friend in a video. How the heck did they create that? Yep. Right. I know my friend's not going in. You know iMovie and doing it. They've got to have yeah. some. App. No, pe- got to people have assume video. because like I would respond. Like I would respond to. And I always like to re- like turn like celebrities on like that uh, into a GIF like really quickly and then <laughs> and then I respond to them and then all their friends they see the replies like, did you just really just spend like hours doing like, no it takes like, twenty seconds. Yep. But, um, but that even that is like it's there's one a lot of technology behind it to be able to get it just off a selfie and not off a video or uh, it, it's they're the best at that and then two there's a whole art component to it where, um. There's a lot of subtleties that make him so likable where I'm seeing like 100 people's reaction, like it's just universally, this is, this is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a very fine line between uh, creepy and awesome <laughs> in these Absolutely. things. Absolutely. And they're like, they've nailed that basically because they used to, they came at it from a way of like wanting to put you in video games two years ago. So it's more of like an art. You, like it, you definitely recognize the person, but it doesn't look the real. It, you don't like mistake it for actually being realistic. Got it. Um, okay, so... What's your view as somebody who's an early stage investor, consumer products, based in Silicon Valley, of the crypto industry, right? Wh- where are you sure you want to ask? It? I, I, I'm asking, that and I and I truly want the good and the bad, yeah. right? Of how sitting in your seat, you see the industry. I fully believe in it in, in the long term, and then a lot of things are exciting in the short term, but there aren't too many like use cases mm-hmm. at, at first. I feel like. And especially with the ICOs, it's like, it's it's definitely an innovation on the fundraising side. But then, what happens when you have a like you're essentially funding like a seed company with a hundred million dollars? Like that, if you gave like a seed startup thirty million dollars, that will um, promote kind of bad behaviors, like you mm-hmm. know, very like too fancy of an office or just all these extravagant extravagant things that we've seen in, in certain startups. So, like, I know, like, there's probably, like, mile, milestone-based things that are happening. The, the, the innovation, the fundraising is clearly there, but it needs to be refined more to actually align the incentives and, and the behaviors and, and better. Yeah, well, what, this is interesting. I, I wrote this morning, um, underfunding can kill a startup. Mm-hmm. Overfunding can kill a startup yeah. as well, yeah. right? Um, and uh, when I first started investing, somebody told me, uh, they were like, look, no matter how much money a company raises, they spend it in 18 months. If they raise a million bucks, they spend it in 18 months. If they raise $100 million, they spend it in 18 months, <laughs> right? And there will be out fundraising again, right? And so to your point, the difference between a million, 30 million, and 100 million, where does that delta go? It's not usually in headcount. It's in how how nice the office is, whether they serve lunch or not. No, right? even even then, it's like, so you could, like, uh, e- even with with headcount, like, well, then you can afford to pay whatever. I've seen, I've, have, yep. I've had friends who've gotten, like, ridiculous offers uh, for salary, like double, yeah, we'll double your salary, sure. Which is like insane because if you if you, if you're like one to get a raise, okay, can I get like ten percent? <laughs> so it's people like I mean that, and then that in turn like um, who like the, the type of people that attracts probably aren't the best because they're probably motivated by by what you're building or and then 
Yeah, like, nobody should be like that motivated by salary. I think like, I've my entire career, I've like really like work for free or mm-hmm. or way kind of under just because that was like a side thing, probably to a fault because I shouldn't have accepted free things. But it's just it's following kind of what you w- want to work on because mm-hmm. um, your time is your most valuable thing. And then if you're just doing something for a salary, then maybe you, you don't do your best work. So uh, that that only that's only a motivator to some extent. Um, I think w- is it fair to say with the crypto that's kind of a, an issue, like the, how much people are getting paid? And yeah, so I don't know how. Uh, th- there's definitely the teams that have raised, you know, in my opinion, too much money. Um, there's definitely uh, you know excess spending going on. Uh, that's everything for offices to I know some projects that are flying around in private jets to you know all that kind of stuff. Um, also paying people too much, right? Um, I, I, I think that the part that is most interesting to me about the ICOs that obviously as an early stage investor where you sit, um, you don't deal with as much, right? So uh, if you think about a traditional deal that you do, you're doing either price rounds or you're doing convertible debt, Mm -hmm. right? And the convertible debt is usually in some standardized form around a safe or something similar, right? In the ICO world, you know, what initially turned me off, you know, over two years ago and just I couldn't get over was the idea that as an investor and a fiduciary of other people's money, when I would invest, there was very, very little investor protections, yeah. right? And so not in a egregious, hey, I want to own your whole company, but in a, if I give you money and you give me this token, it's not equity, it's not debt, it's not a claim on cash flow, what do I own, right? If everything goes sideways and the, and the company's about to go out of business, what's our repercussions? What, you know, what recourse do we have? Um, and, and so I think that the innovation, right, that, that you're talking about is much more on the issuer side, right? Um, th- there's almost like a power law to some degree, right? So uh, the power was in the hands of the venture capitalists for the last two, three decades, right? They, they had the money, they really dictated terms and market comps and things like that. What we just saw over the last two, three years was a massive swing to the other side where founders all of a sudden were raising tens of millions of dollars of non-dilutive capital, <laughs> right? And sometimes even could do it, and a lot of times without the VCs, so they're completely boxing them out of deals. Yeah. I think that there's probably equilibrium to be found between those two extremes, yeah, right? I mean, Naval talks about this a lot, the unbundling uh, of capital and, and advice, and, and there's another thing, but it, it's, it's being unbundled, and, and the, the too much of an extreme is not good, because you're actually like, having... When you're raising a Series A and, and someone joins your board, you, like, that is the most like you're essentially like, hiring someone that w- the you, that's unhirable, mm-hmm. uh, and that is a key thing like, from a mentorship part in governance and and advice. That that's actually very key, and maybe you can like get an advisor to do that, but 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 do they feel as like there's a whole balance that needs to be worked out. I think that's a really essential part of an early stage. Well, and, and it sounds like really what you're talking about. So I- if I kind of extrapolate this out, right? So one is you got to have the right founding team, right? You got to have the right community, right? That that part of the team. And you got to have the right investors, advisors around the company and around the community. And when those three things align, you got a shot, right? You still got to go build the tech. You still got to go, you know, I mean solve you those problems. You, don't, you can probably get away with, with, with I mean, some there's always exceptions, but mm-hmm. these sound, what you mentioned, those three things sound like the right balance for something to happen, and then it could still not happen for so many reasons. Um, so Absolutely, you want to have the right. You want to give yourself the best chance of. It's like even just from a, like if you have like too many co-founders, maybe that's like a red. Like that could be a red flag. Right? There's like things mm-hmm. like you should give yourself like the best shot from like that you have direct control over because you have there's so much that you don't have direct control over. Absolutely. Um, how, right. how, how, how much do you think? The things that are valuable in, in build, building a startup that is uh, proven to be important. How much over and overlap do you think there is in the crypto world, and are we not seeing enough of it potentially? Or yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so there's two. There's a level one, level two. Level one's kind of high level. You need a team. You need to go after the you know big market. You got to have a product that solves a problem. Kind of all of those types of things. Identical, right? Level two is more of well, who are the types of members that you need on a team? Um, you know, how do you deal with growth? You know, is it through invites like on Facebook or is it through this incentive token? How do you fundraise, right? Um, the, the, the kind of more nuance or detail um, components are uh, correlated. They look similar, but they are different when you get, you know, really, really in the, in the details. Um, I do not think that a lot of the projects, right? So remember in crypto, we call them projects, which is like 
you know, a bunch of friends always say, like, what are we, like, talking about seventh grade science projects, <laughs> right? Um, no, that, that's what I called earlier when I was talking about the first job. I it was, like, a very advanced school project. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, well and, and I think that what ends up happening is people look at them like they're building a project. And so they throw out all of the things we've learned over decades of building companies and building sustainable organizations. So you get... But, but like, side projects are important, like, even from start, but then it, it changes when you're raising $100 million for your side project. Well, is that a side project anymore, right? right? And, and should investors allow it to be your side project, right? Because I, th I think that part of this is... Um, what is the expectation setting between a founder or uh, a leader of a organization and individuals putting capital forward, right? And so if there's misalignment there, as we all know, it might not play out day one, day 365, or year four. At some point, though, you're going to hit a snag, and that misalignment is going to become very, very obvious and actually going to become a uh, usually insurmountable obstacle. Right. And so I think that what we're seeing in the crypto space is uh, a lot of people who are trying to build companies or projects, but they are not leveraging all of the things that we know that work. So, you know, a couple of examples for you. Uh, they raise too much money. Right. Uh, they spend very, very little time uh, solving the problem and they either focus all on building community or building technology. But if you build technology, you build a community, and you solve the community's problem with the technology, that's kind of the holy grail to some degree. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little bit of that. Uh, and then the teams, right? Um, I see teams that what they're optimizing for is what I call like the sticker shock, right? So What's the sticker shock? The so shock. they want advisors, investors, and team members that have the logos, right? So, hey, I worked at X company. I, you know, spent, uh, I went to Y school, whatever. Um, they're not optimizing for experience, for expertise, for skills. Now, in the traditional tech world, there's still a lot of that goes on, right? You still see teams that, hey, we've got all the people who went to the right schools, who um, you know went play, uh, worked at the right companies, et cetera. But I think that venture investors who do it professionally for a living are much, much better at teasing out, I got it that you went to X school, but they can reference and, and they can kind of get around and say, hey, are you, are you real, right? Do you have the skills to actually do this? Mm -hmm. In crypto, remember, most of the capital that was raised over the last 18 months, the individuals contributing the capital never talked to the team. Right. Huge problem, right? And, and so not because you can't make good investments without talking to the team, but at an early stage startup, the team is probably going to be the most consistent thing that exists through the life cycle of the company. And so how do you, you know, imagine if you couldn't talk to any of the teams before you invest in them. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a key thing. Uh, what, I, what I have seen is I kind of usually say I'm either like the first check or the last check. <laughs> so if I'm like technically as an angel investor, if you're the last check, that's how you're supposed to do it. Yep. Because the price stays the same and, then, and, and everything's like you already know who's investing. You know, you, everything, all the information you could know is there and then you can make a decision. To me, those are the investments that... One, I'm, I'm lucky to be involved in. Like, thank you to yep. my LPs and, and networks for getting, getting me into them. But those, those are the ones I'm less active in because I just haven't worked that much with the team or compared to basically when I'm the first check. Because like, I never ask who else is investing until after I commit. But then, in, and obviously, I mean, you do know kind of if someone's like, you know, towards the end or the beginning. But Absolutely. if I'm one of the first commitments, then um, by extent, like if I'm excited enough to invest, then I'm excited enough to get other people to invest too. And then that means I'm pretty much like putting together your round or, or at least helping yep. there. And then by extension, I end up like working very closely with the founder, either on the product, but uh, or at least at that point on the, on the fundraising side. And then I either like set, introduce them to like everyone and then maybe like they close nothing. And that like, that's like frustrating because I mean, how are you going to hire? How are you going to like, it, it sh it, it's telling. And then maybe you close everyone and then like you kind of amplify you. You've taken something and then you've like really like you... It, it also so it shows that okay maybe I want to put more money in it it, it just it gives me more knowledge of what it's like to work with someone and then mm -hmm. that's what that's how that's what happened with uh, with Morphin where I wasn't sh like thought it was like uh, too silly like to invest but okay it was like very on pieces I'll do like I thought like maybe I'll do like twenty five k but then okay I'll do fifty k and then I work with them more and I got more conviction on okay let me do like hundred k and then. And then I was like, I can like syndicate out like another two hundred k. So it's, it, it, it gave so you went from twenty five to three hundred. Yeah, it's my it's my biggest investment. So mm -hmm. very, it, and that's because I've, I've worked with him. He just kept impressing me. So it's that's that's the other thing. It's the more you know someone, like unrelated to the fundraising side, it's they could they could show you what it's like to work with them, and then and then 
they could that could either like, make you less excited about them or they could use that and keep exciting even more where like they are like i'm already excited i'm already investing but then they just keep impressing me even more so that yeah it's it just more information about the sector works it, it, it is one of the only places in the world where um past performance is a great indicator of future performance, right? If somebody has proven that they can execute on the company itself, not necessarily previous companies, which, yes, which may or may not be telling. Like a lot of founders, especially like when when they're in the wrong environment. So like let's say a founder like used to work at Twitter and like didn't fit in. Yep. Well, that's much different than a, a startup. So like maybe like well, and it's hard to tell what impact did they actually have at Twitter. Yeah. Right. But it, I, I think what you're saying here is if I start a company today and I prove for the next six months that I have executed. Six months when I come and ask you for money, it's a very good signal to you that I will likely continue to execute. Yeah, right? which is why I've it's good done. to talk to someone. It's funny if they say no. Um, like what you should never like really get some, someone to say no. Like you should pretty much know when if they're what they would say. You're like not trying. It's not like a rant. I, mean, I guess I when I asked people for money initially, I didn't. I thought they would say no, so it's fine. But it was more like. Like why not try? But then yep. even if say no, it's like okay, that's a reference point, and then you come back a year later and and, and involve them. But if you're actually asking them for to make a decision, you should pretty much know they'll say yes, because and because you should have already done all the work up front to get to that point where you know it's going to resonate with them. Um, and then maybe things don't work out, but it's fine. But but even if they don't, then okay, well maybe maybe they'll do your next round. I know it's different for with crypto, but it's 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 an essential kind of reference point, and as opposed to like meeting someone for the first time and and seeing just one snapshot where you're at at this point as opposed to like look at how much we like you could say like you've you've sold a hundred thousand uh, one hundred thousand worth, worth of revenue and then come back in a year and say you've sold one hundred ten thousand. okay that's like not yep. impressive or you could say we okay we we saw you like 30 days ago and, and we're at zero 30 days later we're at a hundred thousand not that not that hundred thousand looks great so absolutely what um so uh i'm gonna ask you one last question then you can ask me one question <laughs> What is your best piece of advice to somebody who wants to, uh, let, let's talk about an international individual who would like to break into Silicon Valley or become connected in Silicon Valley? What, what, what do they do? It always comes down to uh, teaching people that something. So right now, for example, if you're based in Germany, for example, then a lot of, a lot of Silicon Valley investors, I'm, I'm just generalizing, but it's an active thing, is a lot of Silicon Valley investors want to uh, invest more outside Silicon Valley mm -hmm. because it, it there is so expensive and, and it kind of prices a lot of people out and, and there's a lot of great opportunities in the United States, but also internationally. And I, I made a, a, I have two companies in London, um, two in France, one in Berlin. I've made, I mean, I know a lot of investors are maybe not maybe they're more investing in outside, like more around the United States, but definitely there's more in Europe. So if you're in that local, like, let's say you're in Berlin, then, well, you could find those investors that are looking forward to invest in, in Europe and then like, show them, like, Here, here's what's cool in Berlin. Be mm -hmm. like their person, like, pretend like you're already working there and pretend like, and this is like, in, if you want to get into VC or you want to get into a startup or whatever, is like reach out to the person that's, that's most relevant, but and te it needs to be, it's not anyone, it's just a person that is actually in, in Europe, but they're not in Europe, they're in Silicon Valley. So teach them about Berlin, teach them about about the European startup ecosystem, like, and then, like, and don't ask for anything. Just like give value. Like you're not, and then after you've like sent a few emails or tweets or with just relevant information, then you've probably earned the right to, um, hey, can you can you actually introduce me to someone? Yep. And then, and by that point, that person will will want to do that because they, they feel like they know you, and then and that now you're kind of asking them to pitch you to someone else, and then that reaffirms for them that they actually. Um, like, uh, for example, like Chris Saka made an introduction like for me recently, and I'm like I was blown away. I didn't even know he knew that much about me. <laughs> so, so it was very telling. But that was over like years of years of years of like building kind of slowly kind of a relationship. Yep. So yeah, just give give value without like give more than you take. Yeah, absolutely. But it's uh, not just more than you take. It's like only take like a little down the line after, <laughs> like, after you've given so much. Or like of course they would like want to help you. Absolutely. Um, all right. What uh, what one question do you have for me? What consumer crypto products are you most excited about? Uh, that are more like in the next twelve months are more uh, ready for true market. consumer. Yeah, that happen to be crypto. Just pure consumer products that happen to be crypto. Is so I don't think that any of the pure consumer crypto projects in the next twelve months are interesting. Hmm. But I will caveat that and say. 
there are a number of products that uh, are actually outside of crypto that are starting to incorporate crypto, right? Yeah. So they're not pure play crypto. So Robinhood's a great example. Square's a great example uh, with their Cash App, et cetera. Uh, I think that those are super interesting because what you're doing, you're taking highly um, kind of experienced, uh, very, very data-driven teams that have uh, over time iterated on that user experience um, and they understand their growth models and levers of, uh, of control, et cetera. And now they're incorporating crypto into that ecosystem or that system. Um, and when you do that, what you get is crypto now becomes this great user experience, this great consumer product, et cetera. I think that most of the core crypto products, other than say, maybe you could say like a Coinbase, a Circle, et cetera, they are the exception to this rule. But the rule really is technologists are building technology. I don't really see that many products that I'm like, wow, I wanna use that super easy and I could walk up to anybody on the street, show it to them and they're going to intuitively understand how to use this, right? Some of that is driven by the underlying technology, right? So if, you know, MetaMask is my be my favorite example here, super difficult to use. A lot of people don't know how to use it. A lot of people have actually never used it before. And so if your product requires that as a criteria to, you know, be used on a daily basis, there's a lot of friction, right? And so some teams are just going to have to wait for the infrastructure to get better, and then they can build these consumer products. Uh, but some teams can be more thoughtful about how to build the consumer experience and, and um, you know, a lot of that stuff. And, and if they do that, I think that, you know, my answer could change. But right now, it, it's, uh, you know, go infrastructure because the, the consumer side is, uh, is not looking great. Yep. All right. So, um, awesome, man. Thank you so much for coming. I, uh, I, I really appreciate this. You've got a, a, a unique view in the world, and uh, um, hopefully we can, uh, we can do this again. Thank you for having me.